Start basketball. Are you connecting with the athletes that you're coaching? Do they know that you care? Do you want the best for them? Do you have a relationship? Because when you create a relationship with somebody and they know you care and love for them, they'll want to run through a wall for you. Jim Huber is the director of coach development and lead instructor for Breakthrough Basketball. He has over 25 years of coaching experience at the youth, high school, and college levels. Huber helped Breakthrough Basketball grow to conducting over 300-plus nationwide camps and reaching more than 12,000 campers yearly. Jim has devoted a large portion of his professional career towards developing youth through sport. He has been instrumental in helping more than 70 high school student-athletes earn college scholarships. Jim is a graduate of St. Thomas Aquinas High School, where he was a three-year varsity starter, earning honorable mention All-State honors his senior year. He then went on to play at Allen Community College and Avila University. Hey, Hoop Heads, transform your training this April with our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Get $1,500 off any new machine in the month of April. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoop Heads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel all-star and ct models visit drdish.com for details that's a great deal hoop heads get your dr dish shooting machine today hi this is asim ristogi from essential coaching and you're listening to the hoop heads podcast if you're looking to improve your coaching please consider joining the hoop heads mentorship program we believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly, mike at hoopheadspod.com. Follow us on social media at hoopheadspod on Twitter and Instagram. And be sure to check out the Hoop Heads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoop Heads listeners 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Have pen and paper handy as you listen to this episode with Jim Huber from Breakthrough Basketball. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Linsing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight. And we are pleased to welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod, Jim Huber from Breakthrough Basketball. Jim, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Well, thanks for having me on the show tonight. I appreciate it. Excited to have you on. I know we're going to dive into a lot of interesting coaching topics and things that are very relevant to coaches out there in the world today. But let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. Just give us an idea of how you got into the game of basketball when you were younger. Yeah, for me is uh, you know I grew up with my my dad was an air traffic controller, but he's also a youth coach. So, and of course back in this is like uh, um, you know kind of the late seventies, um, and at that time you know you, you think about like youth coaches weren't weren't paid for what they did; they just did it as a passion and uh, something they loved uh, to help and work with kids. So. I grew up like seeing my dad coach uh, other kids in the community, and he was kind of known as the coach. And I go to a lot of the practices, whether it was you know football, um, basketball, baseball, and I kind of got into the basketball side because I'm, I'm from Kansas City. And at the point we had the, the Kansas City Kings was big at that time, and so we had season tickets. We used to always go to the games, and you know when you're down there and you're seeing like 
you know, Larry Bird and you're seeing Julie serve and Dr. J and magic come in and you see these individuals that are playing at this high level. And, you know, there's a desire to, to be like, like that, like, like, so like be like Mike, Michael Jordan back in the day too. So for me, it's just, you know, I, I got a desire from it to see my dad coach and then I got involved in it. my dad played, you know, high school basketball was a pretty good high school player. And, um, he'd work with me at home in the driveway and, uh, we play a lot one on one and then I started playing with my friends and I uh, got eventually onto a kind of youth team back then. You know, we didn't start really playing them. So like the fifth grade on teams, you know, he didn't start as early as like kindergarten nowadays. <laughs> um, so, you know, played fifth grade, uh, CYO teams and kind of fell in love with it, playing with my friends, my buddies and just translated into high school and college and, and uh once I got out of college, I realized, you know, you have that dream. You want to play professional basketball. But at that point, I realized it wasn't good enough to play professional. Um, I wanted to stay in the game. So uh, I had a desire, kind of my, my dad and other mentors that I've had that have coached me, like I had a desire to coach as well. So I started to kind of, uh, you know, getting into to coaching at the college levels, kind of when I started out. What do you remember about your dad as a coach, something that you took from him that maybe still is a part of? of you as a coach yeah i think i think my dad the thing i got from him is like you know he always talked to me about you know having a positive attitude um but working hard you know it's like work hard but work smart and you know he'd always get on me about like you could go out and and work on your game and you could spend you know many hours out there but you're not really improving so he talked to me about you know how to work on the right things in a right way um, and understanding one thing I always got from him that I've always used is like uh, how you do anything is how you do everything. And he would get on me about that, whether it's basketball and he'd relate it, whether it's, you know, like in school. And if I didn't do well in school, I mean, I, I would play and he wouldn't let me play. Um, so he realized that everything mattered in my life, uh, not just the game of basketball. Was coaching, you mentioned that just like every kid, you had the dream of playing professional basketball. And at some point, unfortunately for all of us, the ball stops bouncing. So are you one of those? We found in the course of our conversation with coaches that there's really two schools of coaching in terms of how guys get to the profession. There's some people who grow up and even when they're playing, they're like second or third grade and they're already drawing plays on a napkin or on the back of their notebook in school while the teacher's talking. And then there's other guys who they're playing, they're playing, they're not even thinking about coaching. And then all of a sudden they get done playing, they look around, they're like, oh man, the game is going to go away here because my playing career is over. Maybe I need to get into coaching. Do either one of those descriptions fit you better? Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's you know, I I mean, I grew up and I realized as I, I went to uh, junior college, it's funny, when I uh, left high school, I had a high school coach that used to uh, be an assistant at Iowa State under Johnny Orr back in the day. And then he was our, he was our head coach in high school, moved into Kansas City. And it's funny when I was – leaving he was telling me he's like hey it'd be better probably if you went to like an nai school went to small school and, and it's funny i went to junior college when i went in there it's like this coach was telling all these type of things that he's done with individuals and uh, the levels he can get to and, and there were some high level kids just back in the jayhawk uh, conference back in uh in kansas and, and the guy on our team was like isaiah Ryder, jr Ryder, played in the nba and we had like some high level kids uh high level players so when i went there I, I wasn't used to that type of level of competition. We had kids out of Chicago and uh, L.A. and different places. And, and I grew up this different in those days. We didn't have the travel teams and that, so you played in your area. And it was, it was eye-opening for me. I was like, whoa, okay, <laughs> um, different level here. Um, so I realized I, I was there for a year, and then I went to NAI school, played there. And, and, I, and then when I was there, I always kind of like was kind of leaders of teams and did the little things to help us succeed and wasn't like – um, getting away with athleticism, being like, you know, six foot undersized and not extremely quick. Um, so I had to kind of outsmart uh, individuals on the floor and that coach mentality. So I kind of had that. And I knew when I was in college, I, I wasn't going past that, but I had a desire to stay in the game. And I love even when I was playing, working with individuals, uh, people on the team and helping motivate them and getting them better and working out and uh, kind of leading some of those workouts. Would you say then that the first thing that attracted you to the coaching side was maybe that individual player development where you're actually working on kind of taking what you knew as a player in terms of 
helping yourself to get better and translating that knowledge to other players that you worked with initially? Is that what you would say maybe your first love was when it came to coaching? Yeah, I think so. And I, when I was in college, I had a college coach that was really big into, you know, not only skill development, but really player development at the time and, and developing as a complete person. He was a big kind of a John Wooden, Bobby Knight kind of guy back in the day, but he would have like um, reflections of the day, uh, emphasis that you had to memorize and you had to know and just like quotes you had to know. And uh, I, I really just saw the development that he did with individuals to make them better people. And uh, that was something that lit a fire in me. I was like, wow, that's really cool. And I saw people get better, not just improve as basketball players, but as people. And I think that was a desire for me. I saw the sport of basketball through this coach. And I was like, it was kind of a carrot that he had. And these individuals wanted to play the game, but he developed them more into better people than just better basketball players. And it's interesting because I think the further you go back in time, and maybe this is just a stereotype, but I think in a lot of ways, there's a lot more awareness now in coaching today of the importance, right, of making your players better people and having that be a part of it and incorporating life lessons and all those kinds of things. And I think the best coaches have probably always done that. But if you go back in time, I don't know that it was quite as prevalent back, let's say, while you or I were playing as it is today. I think coaches are much more aware of how important those relationships are as compared to in the past. It was more, hey, you're going to respect this position. You're going to do what I say because I'm the coach. And the relationship piece of it, in some cases, wasn't always as important. So when you think about the relationships that you had with your coaches when you were growing up as a player, how did those relationships impact you and how you felt like you would want to interact when you had players that were on your team? Yeah, I mean, I felt like the coaches I had were demanding. I didn't really have um, – I felt like there's probably one coach at one point when I was in college, uh, at junior college, I felt like was, uh, you know, more about – the winning on the scoreboard and uh, not holding people accountable and uh, allowing people to get away with things that I felt like should not be allowed to get away with. But I felt like the majority of coaches that I had were individuals that, you know, they demanded of you, they expected greatness um, and, and they were tough on you, but I felt like they, you, they cared for you and they wanted the best and, you know, they would reach out to you uh, they would see how you're doing, things like that. And that's the stuff that kind of like helped me to, you know, I mean, I think that's the inspiration for me. I realized those coaches are the coaches I wanted to, to be like. Um, ones that, you know, we want to succeed. They want to succeed on the court or on football field, baseball field, whatever it is. But they knew even after that, you're much more, it's like you're, you're a human being, not a human doer. Um, and those are the ones that kind of, uh, the coaches, I felt like I had quite a few of those in my life that inspired me to do what I'm doing today. Yeah. I love that, Jim, because both Jason and I are teachers as our day job. And one of the things that I think is always so important to me, and I think it also goes to coaching, but it goes to teaching as well, that there's so much emphasis in the teaching profession about, Hey, we got to raise test scores and we got to get this and we got to make sure that we teach this entire curriculum and not that that stuff is not important same way in coaching like again part of your job as a basketball coach is to coach basketball and help your players improve on the basketball floor but ultimately the coaches that it sounds like had the most impact on you and when I think about coaches and teachers that I remember as my favorites as the ones that I really loved they're the people who put their arm around me and built a relationship with me and asked me about how I was doing with things off the basketball court or outside the classroom or what was going on in my life. And that's really, I think, where as coaches, as teachers, that we can make an impact. And so often, especially in the teaching profession, you end up looking at, okay, this teacher's a good teacher or a bad teacher because of their test scores. Well, ultimately, whether or not I teach you algebra or not, yeah, that's important. But really, the teachers who have the biggest impact are the ones who can build that relationship because then that allows them to teach algebra or that allows them to coach basketball and help their players improve because they have that relationship with their players. And to me, that's something that any coach, if you're looking for a way to improve your team, both on the scoreboard, 
but more importantly, as people and building relationships within your team, both between players and coaches and players and players, to me, investing in that relationship piece is so important. Well, that's you go back to this and you kind of say a few things there. One is this is like, you know, I always tell people even in our camps we have and coaches I work with, I'm like, kids don't remember so much of what you teach them. They remember how you made them feel, right? And I think that's the key thing we have to understand. Like as coaches, I, I, I hear a lot of coaches say kids aren't like they used to be. Kids aren't tough like they used to be. Kids don't listen like they used to be. You know, kids aren't motivated like they used to be. And I'm like, well, we evolve in society, but we realize that sometimes, yeah, you maybe can't coach them like you did in the 1970s, right? In the 19, you know, early 1980s. So we have to evolve. But I think it goes back to, are you connecting with the athletes that you're coaching? Do they know that you care? Do you want the best for them? Do you have a relationship? Because when you create a relationship with somebody and they know you care and love for them, they'll want to run through a wall for you, right? And I've had to evolve as a coach myself and realizing how do I connect better with the students or the athletes that I'm working with. And I think that's an art and that's a skill set that I think as coaches, we have to go within we have to create awareness within ourselves and find out better ways to do what we're doing. What are some things that have worked for you in terms of helping you to better build relationships with players? And obviously, each relationship is an individual relationship and there are different things you do with different players or different teams. But just in general, what are some things that you found that as you've evolved that you've gotten better at that have helped you to build those kinds of relationships that let you reach your players in a more meaningful way? I think a couple of things is one is like, you know, I come in with kids and teams I coach and, and I, I, I talk about we have standards. We have standards that this is a part of what we do. And this is my expectations. And I and I, I'm demanding these things from you because I want to see greatness within you. And I believe that you have that. And I'm like, to let you settle. Right. So so I talk to more about the expectations, my standards. Why? Because I want the best for them. And I'll speak to him a lot about this is not about just basketball. It's about life. Like this basketball is a vehicle for me to transform you into the better person. And I'm not going to let you settle. And you're not going to settle around me and understand because I care and I want the best for you. So I will, I will kind of, you know, start that and preface that from the beginning with, with kids and their parents to understand that. And so when I hold them accountable, I'll talk to them about like the reason why I'm holding them accountable because of circumstances in life and any choices you make, but I'm doing it because I care about you and I want the best. And so I'll do that. If there's times where I feel like I'm demanding in practice and doing that, I will still make, put my arm around them, you know, um, afterwards over on the side and talk to them and explain to them what's going on and why I did what I did and that I care and I believe in them and I want the best for them. So I'm always making sure, like this is a this one instance for you. A couple of years ago, I had a team that I was coaching, and it was a tight game at the end. I felt like a couple of kids they weren't you know playing as well, and I demanded a certain thing from them on the bench, and probably didn't go about it the best way per se. And after the game, I reflected and I thought about it, and I'm like, I don't feel good about it. So I reached out to each one of them separately afterwards and had a conversation with them on the phone, like did a FaceTime, talked to them, said I apologize. And I'm not perfect. You know, there's things may have said I shouldn't have said in the way I did it because I believe in you and I know you got greatness in you. So I think it's going back to like you can demand of them and you might say things as coaches. We all get emotionally say things, but you have to also tell them that you're not perfect and you admit your mistakes and you're sorry for certain things and you even want to be better that you're human. Right. There's a humanist to us. And I think we have to come with that with our athletes we work with. But I think, like you said, you spend time with them daily, reaching out, communicating and letting them know that you care, seeing how you're doing, checking on them at times. That vulnerability to me, I think, is really important, especially when you start talking about building relationships between players. Right. Because you want the players to get to know one another so that they can play for each other. And a lot of times the way that we do that as coaches is we get the players talking to one another we get them sharing things about themselves and it's important i think to share things about ourselves as coaches and when you do that you make yourself vulnerable you put yourself out there you relay things that have happened to you in your life that the kids can relate to and consequently they get to know you as a person 
And that helps to deepen that relationship so that when times get tough and there's some adversity, that you have that relationship to fall back on. Another word that you mentioned in there, Jim, that I think is really an interesting one to think about in terms of coaching is you said you explained why you made a particular decision to your players. And I think about myself as a player. And so I graduated from college in 1992. And I can honestly say that I don't think, at least not to my knowledge, I don't ever remember a coach explaining to me necessarily why a particular decision was made. Okay, we made this lineup change or we we ran this particular play in this situation. I don't remember a coach ever walking over to the sidelines to me and putting their arm around me and say, hey, Mike, here's why we made this decision. I just don't remember that. And yet today, I think as a coach, it's so important to be able to share those things with players because as you said, it builds trust. So how, what's your evolution been as a coach from when you started to where you are now with, with the word why and giving those players that explanation? Yeah, because when you first, like, I started coaching back in 1993. Um, so, I mean, you know, I've been in it for like 29 years. And when you start at that point, even at that, I remember one of the guys I was assisting in college and, you know, he would decide not to start a kid or do something. And one of the assistants would be like, man, we need to, we need to talk to Ben or we need to tell him. He's like, oh, we don't need to talk to him. He didn't, he didn't figure it out. And, and he's like, well, he's going to be upset. He's going to, it's like, oh, he's got to toughen up, whatever it is. And as I evolved through coaching, you know, I realized that, you know, even for myself, I look at it like how many times did I play and maybe a decision a coach made, I'm sitting on the bench and doing something and you don't know why and you start to what? You start to ask questions in your own head, right? You're running all these 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 scenarios of, of why this is going on, why it's happening. Some of it may be not even true. And I, I think it goes back to like, like, for example, I had a, uh, this, I coached some youth teams. I had this eighth grade team that I coached recently and I wasn't going to start this kid a particular game. And we were playing at 12 o'clock and we were playing 2 o'clock. And I said, hey, listen, John, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm not going to start you this game. I'm going to start you the next game. And I gave him the reason why we're going to start him, right? And he understood. I mean, how many times can you sit there and you can tell a kid like, hey, uh, we're not playing you as much in this game right now because of matchups or because of this situation. I, I took you out of the game toward the end because we're in a situation where – you know, we had to scramble and certain defensive traps and uh, that's not, you know, your your strength in that area or whatever it might be. Right. And you can let them know so they understand because otherwise what are they doing? They're going to leave and they're going to wonder. And then they're talking to their parents or other people and they come up with scenarios and they might not even be right. And then they get pissed off. <laughs> and I think when you can talk straight with them and communicate it, I like to have no confusion. I want to be straight up. This is what it is. All right. We're on the same page. Right. And even asking kids, I think sometimes, I don't know if you ever experienced this, where you've had a conversation with somebody and you thought it went really well. And then afterwards, you hear back from somebody who said, oh, so-and-so thought this and this and that from your conversation. Like, what? That's not even what I said. Right? And I think yeah, like when they talk about when there's miscommunication, you're at fault. And because you need to be asking like, okay, you know, hey, Jason, what did you hear me say? Can you Can you let me know what you heard me say or whatever it is? Oh, no, 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 that's, I, I meant, this is what I meant. So that way we're on the same page and there's, you know, there's, there's this level of awareness we have and there's no misunderstanding. It's so true. I think that one of the things that, especially I think young coaches struggle with sometimes is having those direct conversations, right? Sometimes young coaches, especially tend to be, uh, you know, you're kind of beating around the bush instead of coming out and saying, hey, this is the way it is. And having those direct, honest conversations, almost every coach that we've talked to on the podcast in some shape or form has talked about the need to be, the term that keeps coming back to me is being brutally honest with players and explaining to them exactly, here's why you want to get more playing time. Here's why you're not playing as much as you want. Here's what you can do to be able to earn that playing time. And I think when you have those honest conversations, then to your point, there's no confusion. There's no going home and wondering. There's no going home and having that conversation with dad who's telling you one thing or your friend who's in the stands during a game is telling you something else. And it just eliminates a lot of confusion when you know exactly where you stand. And yet I think sometimes coaches feel like, oh, especially in today's world where you have so many players that transfer or leave. I think you have coaches sometimes that 
are afraid to tell, especially their best players, they're afraid, afraid to tell their best players the truth because that best player is going to be like, well, <laughs> you know, hey, I'm going to go somewhere else. So if you had to give a young coach out there advice about having those direct conversations, what would you say to somebody who was maybe struggling to have those brutally honest conversations? Yeah, I mean, I, I and going back to this, I, I see too many coaches, and I'm kind of on the other side, is is they're afraid of losing kids, right? And especially like, it, and if a kid, don't get me wrong, I, I don't want just kids to leave, but if a kid's not bought into what you're doing, your culture, what you stand for, whatever, why do you want them around? Like, I, I don't know, like I, like when I was in college, um, I was assistant at a place, and we had this kid who was really talented, and he was a knucklehead. And he just like would not a good teammate and do certain things, but the coach would allow him to do it because he's like, we can't get this high level. He's an NBA type player. We can't get this type of players at this, you know, this level. Um, so he dealt with it. And it, it, there was so much dissension within the team. We never became as good as we could be. And I'm just one of those believers. It's like, like if you're not honest with somebody from the beginning, and like a lot of people have a hard time having what they call difficult conversations, right? If you can't have a tough conversation initially and you let that go, it festers and it's almost builds into a forest fire and it, and it gets so engulfed and it's tough to put out. And I think you got to nip stuff. Like I'm just a big believer. If you see things as coaches, I see too many coaches, like even going back to this, they'll start off a certain way and they'll be demanding like in a first practice or whatever and say they're going to do things a certain way and then they'll let the next uh, practice slippage they'll let next practice their, their slippage and they'll constantly have the slippage and our crowd will be going on and they won't nip stuff and then it gets really net bad they get on the losing streak whatever happens and then what happens they start getting crazy yell get upset and they're sitting and, and they're going to give ultimatums well, they lost the team they're on deaf ears by then it's hard to pull them back I, i'm a big believer is you, you gotta lay lay the lane here here's here's our here's our standards like i said here's what i stand for if you don't I'm going to nip it. We're going to have direct conversations, and you're going to understand my expectations. And I can even give you a chance to buy in. If you don't want to buy in, then maybe there's some other place that you need to go, right? Yeah, absolutely. That goes to trust, right, where the players have to be able to trust you as a coach that you're going to come in and you're going to demand the same thing. If you say one day, hey, we're going to run the lanes this way, and we're going to run this hard, and this is how it's going to be done, and then two weeks later – you're not putting an emphasis on that. There's clearly guys that aren't doing what you asked them to do. And now suddenly the trust that those players have in you is slowly eroding because one day you're one thing and then the next day you're another. And so I think that consistency is what helps you to build trust. You got to do what you say you're going to do or it's really easy to lose a team. Well, as you said, you got to be consistent whether you're winning or losing. You know, I see too many people like when you're winning, it sounds great. And I – and I told so many coaches, like, you can't get, you can't get caught up in the scoreboard. I don't. I mean, I, 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 I tell our kids we're competing against ourselves, the best version of ourselves. You know and I know. You sometimes play a team that's not very good. And you might win by two or three points, should beat them by 20. And everybody's all happy because you won. And then you go play some team that you should have got beat by 20 and you only lost by one, played your butts off, everybody's disappointed. It's like – no, that that's not the case. Is like we got to focus on being the best version of ourselves on every possession, and it, it it matters. And I think you can't get caught up in just because you win a game, lose a game, and now I'm happy because we won. I'm sad because we lost. And people pick up on those emotions, right? You can't be fair weather. And I think you got to focus on the things that matters through time that will give you consistent success, whether it's on and off the court and what you do. And eventually, the scoreboard will take care of itself if you're taking care of the things the right way as a coach, demanding excellence, doing it in a good way, and making sure you keep those standards high and not accepting less than that. Because, again, somebody's talented and you let them get away with stuff because they're talented, whatever. No, because it erodes your team. Kids see that. And they, they eventually go on deaf ears. You got To me, you got to hold everybody accountable to your standards in the same way. And I think when you do that, win or lose, you get people to truly buy in. Let's go to those two scenarios that you described where one, where you beat a team by a couple points that you probably should have beat by 20. And then the team that you should have lost to by 20, but that you keep it close and you end up losing that game by a point or two. What does it look like 
in the immediate aftermath in the locker room as each of those two scenarios? And then what does it look like the next day on the practice floor in terms of your approach as a coach? What advice would you have for a coach in those two situations? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to, you know, I, I think in the wins, you don't want to get it to where you're beating your team down in the wins, right? And you're not ex- excited about winning a game. So I think there comes a point, like, I would come in, and first of all, I tell coaches all the time, like, I used to do this when I first started coaching out. I used to go in and try to, like, explain a bunch of things and uh, get on if we lost or whatever without looking at film and letting my emotions settle down. Sometimes I would say things when I'm, like, a 26, 27-year-old coach. So I'd be like, why did I say that? <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, my God, you can't get that back. So, I, you know, throwing, like, markers or, it, it, like, breaking a board or doing something, I – and so for me, through time, I've evolved and I'm like, I, I don't like if I'm upset about something, I will I will work on myself and breathe. Right. And change my thoughts and get my mind right before I go in and say. So, for example, say we uh, didn't play well, but we won. I'd be like, hey, guys, I know you're excited. You're happy. We won. Um, we did do some good things. Blah, blah. blah. And you succeed in the scoreboard. But we got a lot of things to work on. And I might, like, if I have a, you know, a sheet in the game, they have a statistics sheet, be like, you know, we gave up, you know, 12 offensive rebounds. Uh, we turned it over 22 times, whatever it is. We, we got to improve in these areas. We got to get better because this team, if we play the way that we're capable of playing, it's a 20 point game, right? So we didn't play to our standards. So you, you have to realize we got to come back to practice and we got to focus on getting better, right? It's about getting better each and every day. We're going to focus on 1% better. If we lost the game and we played somebody really well and they played the butts off, I'm coming in and I'm 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 commending them. I'm talking about man, that that was great effort. You competed, right? You know, it's like we maybe lost by a point or two, and like you know, I always say winning's a fine line, man, between winning and losing. Somebody might hit a shot, they got all excited and they won, and we lost by one or two, and it's like it's a fine line. And we could have had a couple things go our way, it could have been different on the scoreboard, but I'm proud of you how you competed. Um, you know. Uh, and, and I'll encourage them, but also talk to them about still things we need to improve on because these are all I tell coaches all the time. Basketballs are long seasons. I mean, you're talking about close to six month seasons or whatever it could be. And you got to focus on, you got to get your kids' minds right to go in the next day to get better. Because I feel like sometimes people don't go with that mentality. We got to improve. And I'm, I'm giving them something we got to improve on. We got to come in and improve. We're going to get better in this area. So we're constantly improving each and every day that we're out there in practice, making sure we're getting better because it's not like it's the journey we, we, we're on. It's not this like the little destination. We're on this like they talk about with, you know, the great coaches. When you talk about Nick Saban, it's the process. It's each and every day we're on this journey together and we're going to focus on getting better. Let's talk about getting better when it comes to practice design and thinking about what you do as a coach as you're looking at your previous game, as you're looking at what your team has done over the course of the season. What is your process for putting together a practice plan? How do you go about it? What are some key things that you make sure you include in every practice that you have? Just talk a little bit about your practice design and how you go about that process. Yeah, me, my practices are kind of formulated. Like I said, I might spend a little extra time in certain areas that I feel like we need to improve and get better in. But I'll come in and I'm always bringing them together and we're going to have kind of, you know, we have life skill development and character development. So we'll have like maybe a word of the week and we'll have micro lessons on it and we'll discuss it and how we're improving and going to get better. So we'll spend time on that. Um, I'll spend a lot of time on the first beginning, like the first maybe it's like – um, you know, one third of practice, we'll do a lot of skill development. It's going to be a, a ton of, you know, we'll do some one on oh, uh, whether it's shooting, ball handling, finishing, but we'll get into one on one type stuff too. I'm always a big believer in like, we can do some one on oh stuff, but now we got to make it one on one and we got to make it game like, right? So we'll, we'll get into that. And it could be also some skills, some small sided stuff, uh, type stuff, some two on two, three on three. Once we get done with skill, then I really I, – I'm a big defensive guy, big defensive rebounding guy, and I feel like defense and rebounding wins championships. I mean, it, it travels. And I get it that scoring, we got to score. I get that. But I'm a believer if we defend and rebound every night that we're out there, we got a chance. 
Um, and so I'll hang my hat on that. So we're going to spend, we'll get the next one third of practice. We'll get into a lot of defensive breakdown stuff. Um, it'd be, you know, it could be closeout type stuff, one on one type stuff, uh, some rebounding things. We'll get into, uh, shell, different shell type stuff we'll get into. Um, you know, we'll get into some live play off of that. And there's certain things that they have to do to be able to get out on the defensive end. Um, and, you know, we'll hold them accountable, whether it's the communication, whether it's, you know, being more of an anticipating defense and certain screens that we're defending, doing things. So we'll, we'll break that down. Then what we'll do is we'll come back in and we'll do like, I'm a big motion guy. Uh, I love to teach kids how to play, not teach them a bunch of plays, especially on the youth side. I feel like youth basketball is very broken. Um, and I feel like we're teaching kids a bunch of plays, a bunch of continuity offenses that when they go to high school, they go and play for somebody. It's like, well, I just taught them flex for three or four years. Well, they're not <laughs> running flex over here. Or I taught them UCLA cut or I taught them uh, these three or four plays. They don't run them at that high school. So I'm a big believer in spacing, you know, kind of the offense where we're going to teach them how to space, move the ball, move each other with cuts, with screens, with down screens, back screens, ball screens, handoffs, temporary post, penetrating pitch. I'm going to teach them how to play. So we'll do a lot of like offensive. We'll do some drills and that type of stuff. Conceptual. We'll get in some small side of stuff that we'll play. We'll get in transitional play, um, transition defense, transition offense. I believe that you got to be. Can you get, can you score quickly and can you stop people from scoring? Can you get back, form a wall, make it tougher to the top? We'll get into also breaking pressure, traps, uh, full court pressure, half court, things like that, breaking pressure, situational play we'll get into. And, uh, usually we'll have a fun type thing at the end that we'll have them do maybe a game competitive type thing, bring them in, finish on our life skill, character type development that we'll do to wrap it up. And we'll end that way. So that's kind of a base of what I do. It just depends. Like I said, like, um, like this past year, we were struggling a little bit against pressure in the half court, different things. So I spent uh, a couple of practices. I spent a lot of time, like no dribble, one dribble, um, you know, having the other team trap pressure us. They had extra guys on the court. We had to be strong with the ball, step in the basketball, understanding like, you know, a guy on the side, guy behind, guy in the middle, flash. So we'd work on that type of stuff. So you're teaching players how to read situations within a game in a dynamic environment. And I think that's obviously the direction that coaching has shifted away from what you talked about where, hey, we're just running flex or, hey, we're just learning how to run this continuity offense or we're going to just have this particular action. We're going to run it over and over again. Instead, we're putting players in situations where they have to make reads, they have to make decisions. What I always... I'm curious about when I talk to coaches is how do you balance out teaching that stuff and coaching it and still giving the players the freedom to be able to make those decisions. In other words, as the kids are playing, let's say you're playing a small side of game of three on three, you could probably watch that small side of game of three on three. And on every single decision, you could probably blow the whistle and stop it and say, Hey, why'd you make that decision? Or could you have made this other decision? How do you balance out how much you interject suggestions, coaching into that versus how much do you let the players experiment, figure it out for themselves? Just what's your process for teaching those reads within a dynamic environment? Um, I used to probably uh, earlier in my coaching career, I used to like to hear myself talk and thought everybody else wanted to hear me talk. Um, so <laughs> I think I probably interrupted and tried to instruct and show how smart I was on the court. Um, you know, what I do more of now is let them play. But what I'll do is I might like freeze and I'm like, hey, you see this right here? Bang. Came off of this. You had a cruel opportunity, you know, and I explain, show. OK, let's go. Bang. Or I might wait till the play ends and, and stop. Hey, let's you know, replay. Let's go back. Boom, right here. Okay, look, a transition we came down. You're not sprinting back. We're jogging here. We're not getting back in a form of the wall or whatever it might be. Or it might be like defensively, there's a back screen right here. We didn't communicate, talk. and It could be many different things that, that we get into. So I will make it quick instruction, but I want them to get reps. Reps, reps, reps. I want them to play. Um, and figure out some of those things on their own. Now, if they're not playing hard, 
Um, they're not, you know, given the effort that I expect and I want to see, I will stop and really demand more of that from them because I feel like, um, you know, I, I, I feel like kids in today's day and age, and I see this a lot. I don't feel like kids are taught how to play hard. Um, they're allowed to go through emotions and that's one thing we'll all stop and really emphasize, but it's more of short, quick explanations. Let's go. Let's keep working and improving. Let's talk about that playing hard piece. So let's say your team's not playing hard and you step in to interject. Do you, what do you reference when you talk about, hey, we need to play harder? Do you give a specific example in a situation? Like, let's say, okay, a kid's coming off a pin down, right? And maybe they don't set their guy up and they don't break out hard off the pin down. Do you then go back and reference a time where maybe you watch film or maybe a time a kid out of shatter. Just how do you go from this general nebulous idea of, hey, we got to play harder to giving the kids a specific instance of, here's what I mean when I say we need to play harder. And obviously, the longer you go in the season, the kids probably have a better understanding of what it is that you mean when you say it. But just as you're setting that up, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think it's many different instances you can kind of go with them. But I think at the beginning of practices, you're explaining what great effort looks like what the expectations like if i'm sitting there and blowing the whistle and i'm saying we're going this basket we're spreading the basket we're not walking what does it look like we're not jogging we got so much time like if i'm going to drill like if these kids are walking around and they're jogging they're not sprinting areas i'm gonna stop right there and show them what a sprint is and we better sprint right that that's one right there the other thing like i said it could be like uh we're sitting there playing and and they're not sprinting back in transition not doing something i might stop right there and be like show them like Jogging on the floor. I mean, it's not acceptable. That is is not acceptable. And I can't play you if that's going to happen. So it, it could be simple things like that. But the other thing I think is really great is what you mentioned. I'll, I'll show show film. I remember showing a high level kid that plays in the NBA right now, and he was not a great defender when he was in the ninth grade, and he thought he was, but he wasn't, and he didn't play that hard. And I remember breaking down film and showing film to the team what it looks like to play hard. And you might show example of other teams playing hard, but then you might have instances you know where your team played hard, and you can show that, and then you can show clips of of this. It's like, is that really playing hard? No, it's not, right? So I think it's good to show visuals, and sometimes it might not be just your team you're showing them. Show them somebody, a team that you know really plays hard and gets after it, and what you would like your team to emulate, you can show that as well. But I think one other thing I want to emphasize on that. I'm a big believer if kids don't play hard and that you can, you can like in games, you can sit there and demand them whatever, but they're not playing hard. The kid's not playing hard. Sit them on a bench, sit, pull them out. <laughs> don't just let them just go not play hard. And you, oh, you got to play hard, whatever. And, and you go, why is it Joey not playing hard? And you get on other kids on the bench about Joey not playing. No, Joey, sit down. Joey, you're going to sit here. And, and when you understand that I, I'll put you back in, and when I do, you better sprint the floor. You better sprint the floor. Or I do like loose ball, get the loose ball, whatever it is. I'm going to give you another opportunity. But I think sometimes you got to hold kids accountable. And one of the ways to do that is sit them on the bench. I'm not a big believer in if a kid misses a shot or he he turns it over or whatever. And you, guys, I used to do this back in the day. You used to like crazy. You just pull, yank him, pull him in and out, whatever. Because I was kind of taught that a little bit. But now anymore, like I will take kids out if, if they don't play hard, if they have poor attitudes. They get like a tight and cold mouth off an official or whatever and use it. They don't do that on my team, my coach. But if they do something like that, they're a bad teammate or they take really bad shots and I got to pull them out to talk to them about it, um, I'll visit with them on that. But I'm not pulling them out just because they make like a mistake. Yeah, that sets up a really difficult situation. Anybody who's ever played under those circumstances, you can see it. We go and watch a game and you can just tell the teams that play scared, right? Because they know that hey, if I make this mistake, I'm coming out. And consequently, you get a team full of kids who don't want to try to do anything because they're not trying to really do anything positive because they're too afraid of doing something negative. And I do think that, unfortunately, we see that too much. But to your point, if teams aren't playing, I'm always amazed, in all honesty, Jim, like I go and my son's a 10th grader this year. And so I went and sat and watched a lot of high school games this year. And quite honestly, I'm amazed by the number of times that the kid, there's a turnover, and the kid maybe walks two steps down towards the end of the floor and doesn't run. And 
I'm looking going, is that kid really going to stay yeah. in, the, in the game? Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm constantly amazed by the number of times that the kid just doesn't run the floor. Now, granted, sometimes as a coach, especially as a head coach, you're, you may be watching something else. You may not necessarily see every single guy in every single possession. Sometimes you can miss it or overlook it. Obviously, you go back and watch the film, you can see it. But so often it happens. I'm just like, how do you how do you leave the kid in there after that, even if it's one of your best players? Get somebody in there, talk to them, and get them back in and say, hey, we're not. this isn't going to be acceptable. Because at some point, that's going to cost you a big game because somebody didn't get back and – kid misses the layup and now suddenly there's nobody there for your team to get the rebound because they just assumed all that shot's going in and they're just not running hard it's it's amazing to me well see that goes back to i think coaches like you might get away like you talk about you might get away with some of that in, in games you're expected to win right or you know certain games a year but when you got to win a big time game in a big time moment the little things matter and I've seen teams where I remember a couple of years ago, a talent, this was a talented high school team. I mean, they, they had a lot of really talented players, but they weren't really together as a team. And I remember talking to one of the guys who was administrator at the school, and he's like, oh, we're going to go to state. And this I go, no, you, you guys aren't going to state. And he's like, look at me. I go, you're not. Because I said, you can beat, like, teams you're supposed to beat and teams that maybe are close to, you know, you're a little bit better, but the teams that are, like, really, really good, you won't be able to beat because you're not going to do the little things on the defensive end of the floor, consistent rebounding, and you don't play together as a team, and you have kids with poor attitudes and they get away with it, it ain't going to work. And they got beaten like sub-state. They never made it out. Um, and you can see those things. So I, I think you can't get caught up in the fool's gold, you know. Like I think too many people do that. It's like, no, that's not how championship teams are made. I agree with you. I think one of the things that when I try to look at what makes a good coach, and I was fortunate enough, I was an assistant varsity basketball coach underneath a guy who he's now at a different high school than the one that we coached together at. But one of the things that I always told people about his ability to coach a game was that we always beat the teams we were supposed to, and we always competed against teams that were better than us. And we won our share of those games because we were always prepared. Our kids always played hard and because they were disciplined. And I gave him all the credit for that. I think when you look at a team that has talent, it's easy to say, ah, team wins. And just like the team that you described where, yeah, we can beat up on these teams that were better than, and everybody's great when you're a front runner, right? Everything looks good in that environment, but it's really a matter of, yeah, you got to beat the teams that you should, but how do you do against the teams that you're even in talent with or teams that are better than you? Do you win your share of those games? To me, that's where coaching and discipline and having the right culture and building your program in the right way, to me, that's when it really makes a difference is when you're playing against teams that are of a similar ability or better than what you have on your team. Yeah, and, and I think that goes back to is, is like the, the little things matter. And I go back to coaches like, you know, even teams, like what's your identity? What are you? You know, on the offensive end of the floor, defensive end of the floor, somebody asks like, hey, these are three things you do well. What are they? Because I feel like sometimes you look at teams and it's like, oh, you're okay. You're good at these areas, but you're not great in certain areas. What do you hold your hat on? And, and I think that goes back to like, and I tell coaches a lot of times too, you got to be consistent in what you believe in and stay true to it. Not that you can't adapt and adjust, but I see too many coaches sometimes when things aren't going the way they expect or they want it, they're always trying to find the answer, right? They're always trying to find, oh, maybe I'll do this or the next thing or whatever. No, it's like stay true to who you are, what you believe in. And be great at it and making sure that in your practices and what you do, and then as you go into games, that you're coaching and teaching to reinforce those things. How long did it take you in your career before you felt like you had a handle on that in terms of who you were as a coach, what your general philosophy was? And obviously, again, it varies from year to year depending on your personnel and your team and all that. But when did you feel like you had a grasp on this is what I believe about how the game of basketball should be played and how I want to coach it. I mean, I think for me, when I first started coaching, I was a head coach in college at 25, and I wasn't probably as prepared as I needed to be. And part of me, too, is I think 
you know, when you're young like that and you want, when you start coaching, you want people to like you, right? At times. And you would make decisions based upon them liking you and not so much the respect part of it. They respect you and you're going to make decisions that they're maybe not going to like or, but there's best for the team. And you might not like them as well, but they're best for the team. And I think for me, it took me probably, I would say when I was about, you know, cause I'd say probably, t- probably 10 years, eight, eight, 10 years in the coach. I was probably about 33 when I started or it's about, yeah, it's probably about 31, 32. Um, I was in it and I started realizing like, okay, this is what you have to do as a head coach. And, and I started adapting some of those things and started being effective and having success with it. But I even say this, so I keep evolving, like even for myself, the way that I've coached, you know, when I was 35 is very different than what I coached today. I'm 50, what I coach today. I'm very different. And the way that I interact with my players and um, like, for example, something I, I challenge coaches on this, like, of course, the three point line and, you know, you got all the analytics where it's like, you know, the three or the layup and not the pull up jumper and things like that. And, um, and I know when I first started coaching, it was like defense rebounding, you know, get layups inside certain shots and you might be restrictive on, you know, kids shooting in certain areas. And as I've grown, I've kind of like this freedom of, of shooting, playing fast motion. But I'll tell kids at times, I got this sort of friend of mine named Charlie Miller. We we're talking one time and he played at Indiana for Bobby Knight and we we're talking about shooting and scoring. He's like, you know what I realized? And I talk to kids about this. I'll ask him like, why do you shoot? You know, most kids, when you ask them that, they'll say, well, I shoot it because uh, t- to make it. Yeah, to make the shot, right? And they'll be like, yeah. And I was like, that's not why you shoot. And they kind of look at you funny. And they're like, <laughs> huh. No, you shoot it because it's a good shot. You're open. And you're in the right to shoot it. If you don't shoot it, you're selfish. And see, what I tell kids a lot of times, and it makes sense, is kids a lot of times shoot it because they feel like, and they shoot it and they feel like they have to make it. When you feel like you have to make a shot, what happens? Your body tightens up, right? You stress, you tighten, and you're not as loose. Like when you're working out at home or in a practice, you're just getting shots up and you shoot much better, right? Percentages. I know the game, the fat, the quickness of the game, contested shots, all stuff matters. But what I'll tell them to is after you, you know, you say you miss a shot, I'll be like, what's your best shot? And it's the next shot. It's the shot in front of you. And I think it's this mentality we have to like, developing our players like this trust and you know letting them know that it's okay you know be aggressive and you got a right it's a good shot shoot the shot and and i think when i've started doing that more lately over the years kids are more free on the floor they're more comfortable shooting and i see them be more aggressive and have more success and that's something i've evolved as a coach as well but i think i'm always trying to find ways of how i can be more mindful of my players and help them to be more confident when they're on the court. So when you think about your evolution as a coach and you think about how the game has changed and how you want to continue to grow and improve, where do you go? What are some of the sources that you go to to try to improve yourself as a basketball coach? Are you going to mentors, like you mentioned? Are you going to watching games at different levels and doing film study? Are you reading leadership books what what is it that you do when you say hey i've got an off season i want to improve my coaching in this area where do you go what do you do what are some of the things that you look for to help you improve as a coach well of course i mean you know plug for breakthrough basketball breakthrough basketball we have you know there's just a lot of um, um you know dvds and materials and stuff we have some you know really good coaches that um whether it's offense defense or skill development things like that that um, I can tap into, which is great. But besides that, what I'll do, as you mentioned, like, what do I want to be great at? What do I want to be better at? If it's like, for me, I'll tell coach because they'll ask me, I'll be like, is it man-to-man defense? Then I'm finding out who's the best man-to-man defensive coaches, right? Whatever level it's at, I'm finding who the best is, and I'm studying them. Do they have resources that I can tap into? Can I reach out to them and ask them, like, you know, one of the better coaches they talk about that no one really knows about is Ben McCollum at, uh, you know, Northwest Missouri State. He's won three consecutive national championships, Division Two. would have probably won four if one for COVID. But he has Division One coaches reach out to him and talk to him about, 
his ball screen, you know, kind of man offense and defense and stuff like that. So I think it's reaching out to coaches, but also in technology today compared to when I was growing up, think about YouTube, think about like just DVDs and online type resources and things you do. So that's something I do. Also, like if I was skill development, who are the best skill development coaches out there? You know, I'm looking, you know, at them. Maybe it's a, if it's like a Gannon Baker, if it's like, you know, you look at like uh, Drew Hanlon, you look at guys that are, that are really good at their crafts and what they do. It's like studying the best of the best. So that's what I do. But something I'm big into right now, I'm big into the mental side. Uh, I've been in that journey over the last probably four or five years, the more mindset, the mental fitness. So I study a, a lot of that. So I'll kind of find out who are the best in those areas, understand the mind of how to recondition it for success, um, you know, understanding, just studying and understanding it and how I can teach it to my athletes. So uh, whatever it is, I, I feel like I want to dive in and get better in to help my players and help my team become better. I'm going to find out, research who the best is, and I'm going to kind of, you know, find out resource to have, read books, watch videos, reach out to them personally, and uh, kind of study and get that information. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that mental side of it because that's something I think that is – it's really taken off and exploded over the last five to ten years where it's become something that I don't think anybody really thought about or really talked about prior to that. Maybe maybe a little bit, but certainly not to the level it is today. You mentioned one thing earlier where you talked about just allowing your players to be more free, right, when they shoot, to be able to not focus on – hey, I'm shooting to make this shot. Instead, I'm shooting it because it's a good shot and I'm supposed to take the shot regardless of the outcome because it's a good shot for me. It's a good shot for our team. And so that's a case of you're trying to free up the player's mind in order to coax a better performance out of them in that particular instance. So what are some things that over the course of your studying, your learning, you're taking a deep dive into that mental training, what are some things that you've tried to incorporate either with yourself as a coach or with your players? Well, I mean, I think a couple of things we have to understand. Like, for me, I think it. I challenge people to study, understand the mind, you know, the brain, the mind, the connection. Because, you know, there's, for me, I didn't even realize there was like this subconscious mind. And you have your conscious mind, your thinking mind. And the subconscious mind is like in every cell of your being. Um, it's in your body. And it, and it really... They, they talk about like there's this knowing doing gap, like you know what to do, but you don't do it because the doing's in the subconscious. And the thing that we don't realize is like we're not only genetically conditioned almost through our families going back almost studies of like four to like six, seven generations. And then also environmentally, like when you're born, your conscious mind's not even formed. So almost to the age of reason, it could be for somebody like five to six years old or whatever, everything that's said, done, the emotions around them becomes a part of who they are. And so, like, I think sometimes as coaches, we get frustrated with certain kids because they do things a certain way, but that's how they've been conditioned. Um, so I think we have to understand that. And then we have to realize that there's a way to, you know, help recondition our athletes. And I think part of it too is like, for me, what I've been doing a lot too with, with athletes is, helping them, you know, breathe, become more mindful because sometimes you're breathing your breath, the oxygen that flows to your brain that helps you be able to think more awareness, calms you down. Um, so even like you think about like even athletes, when they come into a, um, a practice or maybe it's a game, whatever, there's a lot of stuff that could go on, on throughout that day. Right. Um, they could have stuff, negative things happen at home could happen in school. They could be carrying these negative things with them. So to me, I want to get rid of this negative energy that they have. And sometimes it's just like breathing, getting in touch with their mind body. And it could be as simple as like box breathing, like the Navy SEALs do that before they go into combat and stuff. It's like, you know, deep diaphragmic breaths, breathing in for four, holding for four, breathing out for four, you know, letting that sit and then breathing back in. And I'll do that with my athletes and then I'll like, you know, have them close their eyes and just visualize and see things and how they're going to, you know, how they want to see themselves at this practice, this game and these type of things and going through challenging situations and how you're going to overcome it. And so just things like that, that I'll do with them and help them help them understand who they are and how, how their minds work. 
um, and create that high level awareness for even themselves. So not only when they're struggling on the court or maybe at home or wherever, they have something they can tap into to help them because we have such, you know, a challenge today with like the the mental health issues that are going on. That's a great example. It's something that I actually read this. I can't remember now. I'm not going to be able to give credit to whoever put this in a book that I read, but talked about how when you are transitioning from one aspect of your life to another. So for example, I'm at school all day as a teacher. I have about a 45 minute commute. I get home and then I'm putting my work life behind me and I'm moving on to with my family. And this author, and again, I wish I could remember who it was, just said basically that as you transition from one part of your life to another on a daily basis, that if you just stop and take 15 seconds and do some kind of breathing activity, whether it's just take a couple deep breaths, whether it's just close your eyes and refocus or mentally think, I'm just going to put what just happened at my job. I'm going to put that behind me and I'm ready to put my best self forward for my family when I walk in the door. And it's something that I started doing after I read the book, which is probably like, I think I read this book over Christmas break. And so it's been whatever, three months or so that that since I started to do that. And it's honestly really helped. You just, before I pull into my garage, sit in my car for 10 or 15 seconds, take that deep breath, kind of let go of what I was doing before and focus on what I'm about to walk into when I go and see my family. And it's sort of the same thing what you're describing, right? Kids can be at school all day. They can have had something happen with their family over breakfast, whatever. Their girlfriend broke up with them. The boyfriend broke up, broke up with them. Boom. You just do this little two, three minutes, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it is to help them to refocus. And now suddenly you've reset their entire mentality so that they can get the best out of where they are in the moment, which, right, that's something that's always out there is focus on the here and now. You can't worry about what's going to happen in the future and you can't dwell on what's going to happen in the past or what happened in the past. You got to look at what's right in front of you, that sort of next play mentality. And that's really, that's really helped me. And I think that's kind of the same thing that you're describing. Yeah. And, and I think too, is like, you know, you talk about like I tell kids, like sometimes even a timeout, you can sit there and have them breathe a little bit. Yeah. Right. Or when they're, when they're getting subbed out and they're, they're having those anxious moments or whatever it is to kind of settle themselves back and get back in the moment. So I think there's things to help them. Like there's so many things we can get into that, you know, even the mind part is like, you know, the inner critic, we have that inner critic within us. Right. And, you know, it's, it's kind of this survival of the fittest we have when we're back in the caveman, you know, walking the street or walking around, you, you know, you're not aware you might get bit by a snake or eaten by a lion or whatever it is. So we're always like, we have this, you know, kind of sensor around us that's, that's looking for the danger, right? So we have this negative kind of bias to us and the inner critic we have within us is, you know, it is it's always like I tell kids all the time, like, would you want your mind to be connected to a scoreboard that's basically putting up your thoughts on a consistent basis? And they're pretty much, no, they wouldn't. And I, so we have these negative thoughts that go on this inner critic. And I think we have to understand we have to replace these negative thoughts, right, with positive ones and reinforce like statements to ourselves to reinforce positive things to ourselves and making sure that we're not saying these things out loud. Because the more you say it, the more it becomes, like they've done studies, the more it becomes relevant or possibly becoming true in your life. So I, I think words are so key in kids understanding, like how many kids say, I can't. No, not yet. Right? Drop the T. It's like certain things I'll tell kids, I don't want to hear that. Don't say that. Don't say that. Right? So you got to you gotta help kids watch not only what they think, but how they speak certain things, especially out loud. And so much of that is being intentional in what you're looking for with your players and what you expect from them and in how you go about doing things. Because I think intuitively, if you and I were sitting there having a conversation with a bunch of coaches, they would all agree with what we're saying. But on a daily basis, would they be correcting the player who says, oh, I can't do that? Or would they be looking for ways to help the player to put what happened in their daily life behind them for the hour and a half or two hours that you're going to be on the practice floor. And it's just a matter of, I think as a coach, you really have to, and this applies in 
many, many different areas of coaching, not just what we're talking about now, but anything that you want to do that's important to you, I think it has to be done intentionally because I know, and I've said this on the podcast before, Jim, that I tend to be a coach that I'll read something, I'll hear something, I'll be like, oh, that's a great idea. And I'll try it and I'll be gung-ho about it for a week or two weeks. And then you talked about slippage. I've been a coach in the past that I've had slippage. I get hooked up on one thing and then suddenly two or three weeks later, I've kind of let that slide if I'm not intentional about it. And so I have to make sure that when I'm coaching that I'm very, very intentional about the things that are important to me, whether that be the mental side, whether that be something related to our culture, whether that actually be something on the floor, basketball, fundamental, skill-wise, strategy, tactics, whatever, I find myself that I have to be really conscious and intentional in order to get the most out of myself and consequently be able to give the best of me to my players. I I think, though, when you talk about being intentional, here's my challenge for coaches, and I I used to probably be more like this, is like you would tell kids to do certain things and be a certain way, but you weren't that. Right? I see coaches all the time, like – telling kids maybe be positive, be confident and uh, be respectful or whatever it might be. And they're acting like, you know, idiots <laughs> on the sideline right, or they're, right. they're, they're in practices, uh, you know, the demeaning players or be in a certain way. And it's like, what are you kidding me? So I think we have to realize that this self-reflection within ourselves, cause I'm always, you know, I've been doing this for 29 years and, and I'm not where I want to be. And, and I'm constantly trying to improve and get better. Whether it's after every game, whether it's after every practice, I'm always constantly evaluating myself. What did I do well? What didn't I do as well? What I need to get better at, right? Um, what are things that maybe I need to communicate to a certain player or a coach or whatever that, you know, I felt like maybe I did something that I, sh- I should have been better at, whatever it might be. So I think we have to go within and we have to work on ourselves. And I heard this the other day. I was reading this and I kind of did a, a video about it. And I love it. It's like this guy was talking about, you know, the idea where individuals, you know, we talk about kids again. They're, they're not tough like they used to be. Uh, they don't play hard like they used to be. They're not good teammates like they used to be. They're not coachable like they used to be. But I think like when we drive down a road, there's signs, right, that we see. And, of course, you see like a stop sign. Well, I got to stop. If I don't stop at the stop sign, I'm going to probably maybe get in an accident or maybe get a a ticket of violation, right? So I got to stop. Well, sometimes in life, we have to stop, right, with what we're doing. Because if we continue to do what we're doing, it's not going to be good. But then you could go down the road and you see what the detour sign. Sometimes what you got to take a detour. You can't go down the same road because you're going to not be able to get to where you want to be your destination. You may have to take a different route to get there. But the one that I did see he was talking about was the U-turn. And sometimes we got to take a U-turn in our life. And that U-turn starts with us. U-turn. I turn. And I go within and I find better ways. It's like Steve Jobs said when he had apple and he was like you know making sure apple didn't go into bankruptcy when he took it over and he's sitting there and his question was always like what's the better way what's the better way not my way not the way i've always been coached always been taught not the way that happened back in the 1950s what is the better way what's the best way and i think we have to be willing and open to to ask those questions and find out what's the better way not only for ourselves but for the athletes we're coaching, for the coaches we're mentoring, for people around us, for parents that we're mentoring that are part of this process that we're helping raise their child through the sport we're teaching. How much more, more, how much more willing are you to do that today than you were when you were 25? No, oh, so much more. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I think when I'm 25, when I'm young, and I, and I, and I get this a lot where I know a lot of young coaches having success and there's a lot of young coaches I see, but, but, Coaching is a process, learning how to coach. Um, and, and it's, uh, I've learned a lot over the years, uh, through just coaching. And whether it's coaching a, um, a high school age team, a college team, or whether it's being a, a head coach of a youth team, a seventh grade team, eighth grade team, fifth grade team, whatever it is, I'm constantly learning. And when I was first started out coaching, that ego was involved and it was about me. And I didn't want people to see maybe I wasn't as good as what I, 
probably was, right? I didn't want to see my inadequacies with, with me being a coach. So I would maybe hide those more and I'd protect myself more. Um, and I think as I've gotten older, I'm just more comfortable with who I am, um, with what I'm doing. But I also realize that if you're not growing, you're dying, right? I'm going to look at the plant in front of me. If I'm not watering it and I'm not, you know, giving it, you know, nurturing it the way that I need to with fertilizer and that, it's going to die, right? So I got to continue to give it life, give it the things that it's going to do to continue to grow. So if, what are things in our life that can help us continue to grow and get better? Let's go to something that you and I talked about on our pre-pod call that we both like to see improve and get better. And that's the world of youth basketball. And we talked a little bit about how important it was to educate parents about what they should see and what they should look for when they're playing with a youth basketball organization. So maybe just start with, let's start here. What are some positives that you see? So let's start with that. And then we can dive into some of the changes that we'd like to see made in youth basketball to make it better for the players who are involved, the coaches, the parents, and ultimately for the sport of basketball. Um, I mean, I, I guess positives in youth sports. I mean, I, I in youth basketball, I mean, I do see that, you know, small side of games and I see like three on three and I see some of that trying to be more um, encouraged, especially younger ages, which I think is great. Um, I think some of the skill development and some of the things that are being taught today in regards to the shooting and finishing and uh, footwork. And I mean, footwork's kind of similar to what it's been, but I think some of the finish and shooting, um, some of the skill development in general, I think is better. Um, but what I, what I do believe if I'm a parent and here's what I'm, I'm telling parents and, you know, I, I got young kids, I got a third grader and a kindergartner and my third grader just started playing five on five this year. And it was like a rec type league. And I probably, I don't know if I'd have started them, but you know, his friends wanted to play. So that was fine. So my kindergartner wanted to play a little three on three. So I let him play that. But I, I, I just think parents realize you don't have to start your kids so early playing five on five basketball and playing, especially year round. I don't know how many times I see people like at young ages, fourth and playing year round basketball. Why? You don't need to. I mean, seriously, it's like uh, you could play four or five months out of the year, five months out of the year, and you could work on, you go some uh, camps, clinics, some skill development, play some other sports, and you can have kids have fun, not get burned out. So, I, I would tell parents to watch out how much you have your kids playing year-round sports. Uh, the burnout rates are so high. You know, 70% of kids by the age of 13 are pretty much quitting some of the sports they're playing. Um, so I'm having them play different sports, uh, finding kind of discovering those sports, having fun in those sports, learning different movements, and, and also not overtraining where you get injuries at young ages. So that's something I'm doing. The other thing I'm doing, me as a parent, if it's youth basketball, I'm going to find someone that's going to coach and teach my kid how to play. And I'm not having, I'm not, I, I'm not big here at zone defenses. I've taught zone defense in high school and college. I've done it. But in youth basketball, I love man to man concepts. I believe it should be taught more, uh, teaching kids how to move with man to man defense, defensive concepts that evolve that. When they go to high school, whether it's somebody's doing a zone or whatever, man-to-man principles will fit into it. They'll understand how to play. And I'm big in teaching kids how to play. Motion concepts, teaching them how to play. I don't want a coach teaching a bunch of plays. Also, hopefully they have a coach running practices that are having kids that they're basically, they're moving. They're working on skills. They're getting reps in practice. They're not just staying around, sitting around, not doing much. Um, I'm also looking for a coach that, is may is challenging my kid in a good way and holding them accountable, but also making it fun, and enjoyable, and not just focus on the medals and trophies and just winning on the scoreboard. Um, those those are things that I'm I'm looking for, and I'm looking for somebody that's going to develop my child through the sport of basketball to help them become a better person, to develop life skills through the sport. Uh, those are the things that I'm looking for 
in youth sports if I'm a, if I'm a parent and I'm navigating my son through it. Why do you think that we don't see more of that? And what can we do so that we do get more coaches who are doing some of the things that you described? How can we reach both coaches and parents so that A, parents understand what they should be looking for and B, more coaches understand what makes for a better experience for their players? Yeah, I mean, I think for parents, it's just got to be to, you know, communicate with them more, to understand, to create a higher level of awareness, to realize what it looks like. Because you think about it, I don't know how many times I've seen this in basketball or in sport in general, just because somebody played in high school or played junior high basketball or did whatever doesn't mean they know, understand the game. Um, So I think just trying to communicate to parents, understanding what they should be looking for, what questions they should be asking is a key um and realizing the process development of a child basketball i think it goes back to coaches though i think coaches like you know you got a lot of parents coaching you got a lot of people that i don't know how many times i've seen it where someone's like just because somebody played professional they play college doesn't mean to know how to teach the game i mean i I don't know how many times i gotta tell people that oh this guy played for so-and-so he played overseas does overseas doesn't mean he can teach right just because they played um, and I think the reason why a lot of people play in zone defenses in youth basketball, one through ones, three twos, uh, run pattern offenses, run like a pattern or whatever, is because it's easy to teach it. I mean, it is. I can tell them to go to this spot, that spot, and I can show them how to practice real quick, and that's it. It is more challenging to teach man-to-man defenses, but it's not that hard to do once you understand how to do it. It's not rocket science. If it was, I wouldn't be doing it. And then, like, motion call uh, concepts on offense, it's not hard to teach again. But I think it goes back to we have to we have to develop. Like, you look at certain countries, they have it to where they have uh, requirements that you have to, like, cert- certification, right, you go through to be able to coach. In the United States, there's not much of that. <laughs> you can pretty much just sign up and coach, or you can start a club whenever, and have a program, and, and there's not a lot of accountability that goes with that to make sure um, they're doing things in a certain way. But a lot of times, you know, people think what they're doing is good the right way, like, you know, uh, playing his own defense at the fourth grade and teaching a one through one or three, two, and they're, they're winning trophies and medals and they're winning on the scoreboard and it all looks good. Um, you know, but there's a lot of reasons why they might be winning because somebody doesn't know how to attack his own defense and, Kids aren't strong enough and can't shoot and whatever. But the, when maturation ages take place and kids start getting better and now they start, you know, being able to attack his own, tear it up, whatever, and they have nothing to, to fall back on. Now these kids, they, I think there's more of the short term growth in, in basketball instead of long term development. Like what's the long term game? And I think we got to look at the long term instead of the short term game. That long term is really important. And I think it's also something that is sometimes difficult for both parents and youth coaches to understand because the lure of winning on a particular AAU weekend is sometimes a lot stronger than the idea that five years from now, my nine players are going to be better equipped to make their high school varsity team because we laid the foundation when they were in fifth grade as opposed to Hey, we're really great at this one-three-one half-court trap where the kids aren't strong enough to throw a skip pass that is needed in order to be able to break that, or they're not able to shoot from the gaps because they just aren't equipped to be able to have the strength that's needed to be able to break that. And so I think that that's something that is really a challenge is figuring out how to get those coaches to be able to focus on, hey, we're developing players not just to win this weekend, but we're trying to develop them so that eventually as they continue to grow and stay with the game that they have that fundamental foundation to be able to learn. And I think you mentioned about certification, obviously USA basketball is trying to do their coach certification, but there's nobody out there that's really requiring that certification in order to be able to coach at any level. And I think that's, that's where there's that disconnect. And on the other hand, I think one of the other places that you see it, And I think this is something that to me, it seems like, it seems like it would be doable. Although I know there's a bunch of competing factions, but 
I've heard this idea tossed around where if you had more organizations that required coaches to get some kind of a certification, whether it was just from the organization that was hiring them, where you gave them some actual coach education. So let's say I'm a city recreation department and those teams are usually coached by parent volunteers. And so often I know that just in my own community, I'll have people that will call me up. They're like, hey, I'm coaching a third grade girls team and I can't get them to do anything. Can you give me some ideas? Can you give me some things that could help? And I think so often that organizations think, well, we're already getting these people to volunteer. Now we're going to require them to take a one hour online course. We're going to have them come to a 90 minute coaches clinic. They're not going to want to do that. And I actually honestly think that the opposite is true. Yeah, you might get one or two people that are grumble like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to go to that. But I think most coaches, especially when you're talking about volunteer coaches, they would probably welcome, I think, that opportunity to learn so that when they went into practice, they would have some good ideas of things that they could do that could actually make their players better and make their experience better. And I just think that there's there's opportunities that if we start small and if people who run different organizations looked at the opportunity of like, hey, I got this organization, we got 25 AAU teams. If we brought in 25 coaches and did a 90-minute coaches clinic with our best coaches who we know do a good job, man, how much better could that organization be and how many more people could they attract if you had everybody on your staff that was providing a top flight experience for those kids. I, I just think it would be, it, I to think me, that would be could. amazing. Here, here's, here's where I think it becomes, like I've done that where you have clinics and you have people come in and you know you show them stuff and then you see them run practices or do things like, oh my God, were they really paying attention <laughs> to the clinic there? or whatever. Yeah. Right. yeah, what what I what I think and what when I started um, a basketball organization that's kind of, you know, it's one of the better ones uh, throughout the United States today. And what our big thing was is when we started expanding, we started getting more coaches in organizations the organization we were like okay we're going to have systems and i think what i would challenge organizations to do and like you said it could be a, a rec organization or whatever a park and rec but to have it to lay out to where here's a program and here's practice plans laid out like we would lay out practice plans here's a fifth grade practice plans here's the first second third fourth we lay out it could be almost like you know uh, 16 practice plans we'd lay out and we'd lay out the structure of them and what we're doing. And then we would have the drills drawn up where they could see it. And then we'd have videos if they could see the drills. So think about this. If I'm a parent, if I'm somebody running the practice, and I don't have a lot of time um, to really study and put something together. But if I could go look at a practice and I could look at my first practice and I could go through and look at the, you know, eight, nine, ten drills or whatever it's listed on there. And I could go look at a drawing of it and see a video. And I could do that before I go in to run a practice. I could go run that practice. Now, am I going to be perfect at running it? Am I going to be at X, you know, teaching certain things? Maybe not, but I'm going to have a base, a foundation of it, right? So I think you have to lay stuff out on a platter. And they can do like a step-by-step -step process that's almost digestible that they can do. Because otherwise, they get too overwhelmed. Like you're having a lot of these individuals don't have a lot of experience in coaching and things that... I've realized things that are simple to me that I could walk in and I could do in my sleep. <laughs> There's other individuals that can't do that, right? That'd be like me going in and trying to do an accounting in an accounting office. And the accountant's like, well, this is pretty simple, but I don't understand how to do it, right? So I think we have to make, if we have systems laid out, and like I tell people all the time, like, for example, like schools that are in small areas, urban areas, or, you know, small towns, and um, they, they talk about we don't like – uh, we have a good team or we have a good group of ninth graders. We don't have a, a good group of, uh, we have a good group of like sixth graders. There's space in between. We'd have good kids in these classes. I'm like, if you develop a feeder program and you would have a system set up that you would train your parents or whoever's coaching these youth teams, your coaches, and they're coaching a certain way and they're trained and you have, again, a back-end system where they can go in and they can get the practice plans, they can watch the videos, they can see the diagrams, and they can lead these practices, you'll be amazed how you'll get these kids to become better because they're being taught 
a certain way because these parents or people's volunteering can do it because it's set up in a way that they're able to implement. I love that from a, when you think about a high school coach and you think about how important that youth feeder system is. And that's been a topic that we've talked about a ton here on the podcast with a lot of different coaches. And to me, I always feel like the involvement of the high school coach and their staff in doing exactly what you talked about is providing that framework, that blueprint for here's what we need to teach in each particular grade. Here are the things that are similar to what our varsity program runs. Here are the things that we need them to know at each particular grade level. And then you have that involvement from the high school coach where that third grade kid knows who that high school coach is. And in their mind, they're already like, hey, someday I want to play for Coach Smith when I get to be a high school player. Or I want to be like player number 14 on that team. And to me, those things are so, so important. If you're going to develop a high school program as a varsity coach, you have to be more than just the coach of the varsity. You have to be involved from K to 12 and get those kids, those parents, those families, that community to know who you are. And as you said, if you can really lay out that blueprint and put together practice plans and get a video together for them that shows them and lays it out exactly the way you want it taught, man, you can have, you can really have something. Because I've seen all different kinds of youth programs where you've got one team that's third grade and they're sitting in a two, three zone. And then you get yeah. to the fifth grade and that team's running a diamond press and going up and down and firing up threes. And then you got the other team that's, they're, they're running this. It's just, you know, and you're like, are they really, are we really developing the kinds of players that are going to eventually contribute to the high school varsity program? And how could you, how much better could you be doing it if you had everybody on the same page? Well, think about this. I tell, I tell people that, you know, when I coach youth teams and I'll tell parents, I'll tell the kids, here's, here's what I'm, my focus, my mission is over the time you're with me. By the time you get into high school, you're going to understand how to play defense, man to man. You're going to understand whether it's how to guard the ball, one pass away, right? Help recover, uh, you know, uh, being able to fend cutters, defend the post, being able to fend ball screens, back screens, down screens, defense transition, blocking out. I'll, like I'll get through all these things. We'll do half court and we'll do full court. We'll do, you're going to learn how to guard, right? No, no zone. We're not doing any zone. No, we'll, we'll basically, we'll have principles down, and then what I'll do is I'll evaluate teams we're playing, and maybe a team's um, really good at penetration, and we maybe still the seams to do certain a certain way. Maybe somebody's got a great post player, we're going to dig in the post, we're going to do certain things, get the ball out. We'll, we'll basically adjust to the team we're playing, right, and do that. And then I'll be like, offensively, I'm going to teach you how to play. The motion concepts we talked about earlier, I'm going to teach you how to play. You're going to be skilled. I'm going to teach you how to handle a basketball, right? How to shoot it, how to finish, right? How to pass, good footwork, be a great teammate, be coachable. You're going to have great life skills and character traits. And I said, I'm going to give you all these things over a couple of years. Now you're going to walk into high school. You're going to be a value, right? Because who, who as a high school coach wouldn't want those type of players? Any high school coach wants a kid like that. And that's to me is what we got to do. We, we as coaches, we got to look at, we're developing these kids for this. And it, it takes time doing that. It's absolutely right. I mean, I think that it's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that you can just wave a magic wand and be like, okay, now suddenly this thing's going to develop. It really takes a lot of time. And coaches that do it well invest a lot of time in putting that program together and figuring out, hey, what do we want our youth program to look like and how does that youth program fit into what we want to eventually do as a high school program. And I think that speaks to one of the other things that has been interesting from learning about the, from different coaches and talking to them on the podcast is just when you think about the amount of time that a high school coach has to put in to be successful. And I think that that, that amount of time continues to, go up it continues to rise when you think about what the baseline level of just to have just to meet the criteria so to speak to be to be on a level with other coaches that baseline amount of time you have to put in has gone up and then if you really want to be successful man to 
spend all that time with your youth program, your off-season development and lifting and then all your in-season responsibilities and watching film. It's just, it's really incredible how how hard high school coaches, especially the ones that put a lot of time in, how hard they have to work in order to have the success that they do. It is, especially what they get paid. Yeah. I no mean, doubt. that's one thing like parents don't even like, if they understood these uh, coaches, the amount of time and effort they spend and what they do, they're almost getting paid minimum wage, really less than that. Um, so, but that's why I think coaches, um, you have to create systems, right? Um, if you're going to, like everything I'm explaining to you, if you're going to sit there and do all that on your own, you, you might as well check out in a year or two because you're going to be burned out and you're going to have, maybe if you're married, divorced from your, from your wife and no relationship with your kids. And so there's a balance to it. But I just think it goes back to like, if you're going to have a youth program, that I'm going to create systems and I'm going to with electronic and online and some of these schools and they have video people and students, whatever, I'm going to find a way to do this with people helping me. And then we're going to put it together. And it's going to be there. And then all I have to do is once you're like, you know, communicate to the parents or whoever's doing this, the kids in youth program, but I'm going to get my assistant coach, the other people involved in it. It's just not going to be me. And I think that's what coaches got to realize. It's like, being more like you see college coaches, professional coaches, like to the CEO of the operation. And you got to entrust other people to do certain things. Um, and when you have systems in place that they can follow, I think you can entrust them to be able to follow them if you got the right people in place. That's so true. We've talked to a number of coaches that have told us that one of the things that they struggled with early in their career was the ability to delegate some of those tasks. They Coaches tend to be control freaks in some cases where they want to just have their hand in everything because they've grown up and you know that, hey, the way that I do things, I feel like I'm going to have some success because of the way that I've been able to do whatever it is. Maybe your background as a player, the success that you've had a coach or your work ethic, whatever it might be. And so coaches sometimes the early in their career, they have trouble trusting that somebody else is going to be able to to do those jobs. We've had so many coaches, Jim, talk to us about once I became that CEO, once I became a delegator, once I trusted the staff and the people that I hired and that I put in the right positions, once I trusted them to do their job, suddenly my job became A, easier, and B, our program became way more successful because there were so many more outstanding minds working on making the program better instead of just one person who's completely overtaxed and just is going completely insane trying to get it all done. Yeah, and I think, too, as a coach, you got to find out what do you do really well. I mean, there's certain things that I, I, I wouldn't delegate. Like like for me, if, I, if I'm if i really good at, like, um, maybe when I'm in practice and leading practice and doing things a certain way to make sure, like, you know, we're doing things the way we need to do or, like, certain game things that I do really well. Or if I feel like when I do it, it's it's it, no one else can do it like that um but if it's like stuff you know it's like ordering uniforms or if it's like um you know sitting there like if somebody got into where they had to organize camp stuff or um it, it could be all, it could be many different things that you can get into like stuff that's like you don't need to be involved in it if you have somebody else doing it and they're good at it or it's like social media nowadays like I'm not, I don't, I don't want to sit there and be on social media and be putting stuff up there or whatever. What I would, I would work to get somebody that's really good in social media that loves doing that. And I would give them like a, the vision of what I wanted to see and talk to them about it and have them do that. That's so true. I think that if you can double down on your strengths as a coach and look, where do I add the most value and where's my time the least valuable where I'm getting the least bang for my buck? Those are areas where you want to be able to delegate and then double down on the areas where you feel like, as you said, where your strengths lie, where you're going to be able to have the most impact. I think that's really key as you look at what's going to make someone a successful coach. We're coming up, Jim, here on an hour and a half. So I want to give you one final two-part question before we wrap up. And that is, when you look at where you are right now in your career and you think about where you're going, what is the biggest challenge that you see for yourself over the next year or two and then number two when you think about what you get to do every day what's your biggest joy when you wake up in the morning when you just consider what you're getting to do day in and day out 
I think the biggest challenge for me um, is not even basketball related per se. Um, it's more of like with the pandemic and with all the statistics that are coming out and, you know, with the mental health issues and, and you got kids that are talking about the anxiety and depression and, you know, you almost got almost like um, 25% of kids, even in, in higher, some of the teens are, have thought about committing suicide. Um, for me, that 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 weighs on my heart. Um, and I think, um, so w- what are ways that I can connect more? What are ways that I can um, to stay in contact uh, to make sure the athletes that I'm working with, are they doing okay? Um, you know, they get in the support that they need. Um, and it, for me is more of that mental fitness. Like, I feel like we so much focus on physical fitness, but I think we got to get into mental fitness, um, and, and making sure that we're strengthening the minds of people. Cause it's like, I tell people all the time, train the mind, the body will follow. Um, and so I think that's key. And that, that's, that's, that's on my heart because I feel like it's going to get, um, it's going to get worse before it gets better um, with with these next couple of years and um, some of the things are going to come from it. So that that's on that side of it. I think the joy for me is, um, you know, I, I get to do what I love to do and and I kind of control my schedule the way I want to uh, uh, do things. Um, and so, so I think when you're able to do the things that you love to do, whether it's like, you know, it's coaching basketball and it's actually um you know, bring in, whether it's sometimes I get to go to camps and work with camps and train players and and train coaches and develop curriculums. I love doing that. But then also I have teams that I can coach and, and I love developing teams. So I feel like I get to do a little bit of a lot of things than basketball that I love to do. And I'm able to use the creative side to always find like innovative ways to do things. Um, and then also said, you know, work kind of from home and control my schedule and be with my family. So I, that's, that's stuff I, I'm really thankful for and appreciative that I have that opportunity. That's well said. It makes a lot of sense. I think when you do have that autonomy and that control, we all feel a little bit better when we have control of our day and, and get to do something that we love. It makes a ton of sense to me. Before we finish up, Jim, I want to give you a chance to share how people can reach out to you, find out more about what you're doing with Breakthrough Basketball. So if you want to share email, social media, website, whatever you feel comfortable putting out there for us, and then I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Yeah, I mean, uh, they can definitely go to uh, um, BreakthroughBasketball.com. Um, and, you know, we have all kind of camp information. There's, you know, products that I have up there that I've done from, like, man-to-man defensive stuff to shooting to we just got done with doing a youth coach development program of similar we talked about is what coaches can do um to be able to develop teams and that so they can go there then also i got a personal site that's coachuber.com um so it's it's h-u-b-e-r but coachuber.com you go do find information there uh, you can contact me as well through there and there's kind of social media stuff and things like that um and there's one other place called 40 athletes, um, dot com that we uh, do some stuff with uh, life skill, character development, kind of like helping kids win the game of life through sports. So those are different ways you can kind of find, re- find me and reach out to me. Perfect. Appreciate that. And Jim, we cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule tonight to jump on with us. It's been a lot of fun having a deep dive into a lot of different issues that are facing the coaching profession. And it's always fun to be able to talk to somebody who's got some innovative thoughts and ideas. So we appreciate that. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the hoop heads podcast presented by head start basketball.